all this is dr mubin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so this study is interesting it shows how the spike protein sars cov2 as well but spike protein by itself causes severe mitochondrial damage in microglial cells microglial cells are the cells in the brain these are macrophages of the brain they are the innate immune system of the brain and when you destroy the innate immune cells in the brain then the whole brain tissue pays the price for that and so that is the discussion that we'll have the basic lesson that we would learn today is how does a spike protein destroy a mitochondria and as a result then cause inflammation and destroy the tissue that is the discussion let's start this is specific to microglia however the same mechanism is going to be applicable everywhere where spike protein is so these are our gifts for humanity they are continuing here are some links to go with this discussion this is drbean.com this is a link in the description for 900 videos a <laughs> premium account for $97 that is 10 cent per video for unlimited access so try it out if you like then here this is the study this is published or this was published on feb 2 2022 mitochondrial dysfunction a prelude to neuropathogenesis of sars-cov-2 and this would be the same mechanism for other areas too then here is another study mitochondrial dynamics in sars-cov-2 spike protein treated human microglia then here is another study that shows sars-cov-2 spike protein impairs endothelial function via down regulating of ace2 this study in itself is a beautiful study to discuss and i would separately discuss what they discuss in this study is how the spike protein when it attaches to ace2 what changes it brings inside the cell just by the attachment that destroys the cell and then here is another study sars-cov-2 membrane protein so membrane protein is a different protein on sars-cov-2 sars-cov-2 and not the spike protein that membrane protein has its own effect as well so this is that study i just left it here for your reading pleasure so now let's start our discussion with my drawings this is the study i just showed it to you here is the abstract of the study here is a summary of the study in this study let me actually introduce you to the characters here these blue blue <laughs> little characters who are actually dead are mitochondria i was actually laughing that why would a mitochondria be standing up when it is dead but oh well this is these are mitochondria this is a spike protein this could actually be a heat inactivated sars cov 2 virus as well both of them do it so i think it is easy to connect the dots that if spike protein causes it and then heat inactivated virus causes it too then it must be the spike protein on the virus that does it although as i showed you membrane protein on the virus can also do the same thing and what did they find so in this abstract what did they find they found a dramatic reduction dramatic reduction in mitochondrial dna increased phospholipid saturation and severe damage to mitochondria what does this mean i'll explain it but for the time being just to go with this summary one or two more statements number one mitochondria are bacteria that have started living in our cells so we provide them protection in our cells and they provide us energy in addition to providing us energy mitochondria also help our cells stay in a state of homeostasis in a normal state mitochondria if destroyed would result in cellular destruction as well so in a way they are not only the energy house they are protection for the cell as well 
So mitochondria DNA is mitochondrial own DNA. It is not a cell's DNA. So they found that the spike protein damages mitochondrial DNA, which in turn causes the mitochondria to not function correctly, which in turn causes the cell to scurry around to say, where do I get the energy from? The mitochondria are not making energy. Imagine the energy powerhouses fail in our community, in our cities. We'll be running around saying, where is a candlelight and where is something else? Where is a torch? Where is a backup supply that I can get energy from? So when cell moves from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration, the cell can only function for a few more minutes, hours, depending upon what kind of a cell it is, and then it dies. So then the question in your mind should be the following that we would answer next. Number one, is it this that spike protein actually just damages everything in the cell and that damages mitochondria and so we are just becoming dramatic about it? No. So that is one question to answer. Second question is, why? How does spike protein does this? That is the second question. So let's, and the third and fourth questions are, what is the value of this information? And the fourth is, what is the how do we treat this situation? And I'll give you the treatment here now and clue to the treatment. I remember I had interviewed Dr. Paul Merrick about two years ago when he had uh, recently floated Math Plus protocol, which contained melatonin. And I was interviewing him and he talked about melatonin, that how it is mitochondrial protective. And he smiled and he said, I just say to people that do the math because it was MATH. So one part of that is melatonin. Melatonin has been known to be mitochondrial protective protein. I have actually done a discussion one and a half year ago about the mitochondria and the function of melatonin and how do they work together. So that's a separate discussion. Let's continue. This is the abstract. So if you just wanted to hear what does spike protein do, spike protein damages the mitochondria, which in turn then leads to the production, the death of the cell. Now, if it is microglia of the brain, that would cause clinically neurocognitive decline, brain tissue inflammation, uh, brain tissue death, and so on. Okay, so let's continue. Summary is done. If you wanted to leave now after the summary, you can. Thank you for being here. Now let's see what is the clinical correlation of this discussion. The researchers connected the dots that when this kind of damage occurs to microglia, again, microglia are the macrophages of the brain, the innate arm of the brain. So SARS-CoV-2 or the spike protein actually attacks the innate arm of the brain, destroying it. So when that happens, of course, those cells, these are immune cells. This is like soldiers of the brain. You go and attack them. In the process of becoming injured, they would fire back as well. So the inflammasomes become activated in these cells. These cells become damaged. They release cytokines and interleukins that triggers in, um, inflammation. So what would happen is the nervous system would develop inflammation there will be neurocognitive decline and there will be neuronal damage. That is a clinical outcome. So all signs and symptoms related to these three will be observed. Now, how did they, what was the study that they did? Here is what they did. They took microglial cells and they cultured them as control. They had them in a nutritional area, they fed them, they kept them at the right temperature. And with them, they also had another pool of cells or multiple pools of cells. The other pools of cells were, were cultured with spike protein in them, just the spike protein. So imagine a few pools of cells with spike proteins living with them. And another few pools of cells with heat inactivated SARS CoV 2. So, three types of um, petri dishes with cells in them. 
controls were just the microglia, nothing else in them. Then another set with microglia and spike protein in them. Another set, microglia and SARS-CoV-2 in them. Then they started observing these cells and saw what is happening. You would find this interesting in this article, in the study, that SARS-CoV-2 or the SARS spike protein caused very similar damage to the cells. So, before we see what was the damage, let's just very quickly understand where the damage is going to be so that we can understand what was the damage. So imagine here is a cell. Inside a cell, the whole space within the cell is called intracellular space and that is there is cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the space between the cell membrane and the nucleus. Outside of the nucleus and inside of the cell membrane, every every all, all that space is called cytoplasm. Somewhere in the cell, usually we make it in the center, usually it is in the center, but sometimes it is on the side as well. Somewhere in the center of the cell, there is another sphere, which is a nucleus that has gotten the DNA. Now, nucleus has genetic material, DNA. DNA has the recipes or genes to make various proteins. Now, those genes, when they open up, they produce messenger RNA. Messenger RNA comes out of the nucleus. Messenger RNA is a recipe, right? It is instructions to cook proteins, to make proteins. The only thing is in our normal restaurants, the order to make something goes from outside to the kitchen inside. Here, from the center of the cell nucleus, the recipe is sent outside. Once that messenger RNA comes out of the nucleus, it is immediately picked up by lots of factories that are surrounding the nucleus. These are endoplasmic reticulums. On the endoplasmic reticulum, some of them, there are ribosomes attached there as well, which are another set of machines or chefs that would pick up messenger RNA and they would make proteins. Endoplasmic reticulum where the ribosomes are attached are called rough endoplasmic reticulum because under the microscope, because of the little tiny ribosomes on them, they look rough. Anyways, outside of the reticulum, I mean, think about it. Recipes are coming to the endoplasmic reticulum. Reticulum is making proteins. So would it not need a lot of raw material plus a lot of energy? right? Because we're, we're just continuously making proteins there. So we need a lot of energy. Guess where the energy is going to come in from? From another layer around the reticulum of mitochondria. So another big sphere layer of mitochondria is surrounding the endoplasmic reticulum. So as the machines are working, in the endoplasmic reticulum. As the ribosomes are making proteins, they're getting energy from the mitochondria. Now, mitochondria themselves also have their own DNA. They also have their own ribosomes. They also have their own RNA. They also have their own machines and enzymes to do their own function. Many of their own enzymes can be formed outside in the Golgi operators and go back in mitochondria. Golgi apparatus is another little structure. Here I made this in red. Golgi apparatus is usually called a packaging material area. Things that are built in the endoplasmic reticulums, they are sent to, some of them, sent to Golgi apparatus where they are further folded and packaged and, and loaded on various things and released. Why am I talking about all of that? First, to make sure that we understand that this tiny little thing, there are millions of them in a cell are mitochondria. So we're talking about something inside the cell. Secondly, the other structures are interesting to note as well. Why? Because when the spike is causing damage, if it was causing damage to everything, and this mitochondrial damage 
story is just nothing but a drama, then you would see the damage to the other parts of the cell as well. But you would see further down in this discussion that other parts of the cell, the the micro, sorry, the Golgi apparatuses and other structures, they stay intact while the mitochondria get damaged. Okay, so now here on the right side, I have made a zoomed in picture of micro, my, mitochondria and I've cut it. So within the mitochondria, there is in, inner space and there are fluids inside. It has two membranes, but within the inner space, it has various granules, it has its own DNA, it has its own RNA, it has its own ribosomes and so on. But most importantly, in its membrane, inner membrane, it has a machine, say, electron transport, electron transport chain, ETC. Electron transport chain helps us, us ourselves, do respiration, aerobic respiration, use oxygen and produce ATP, water and oxygen and produce ATP by using various nutrients in the presence of oxygen. Why, why am I talking about that? When this engine, the electron transport chain, when that engine runs fast, it produces lots of sparks. Those sparks are reactive oxygen species. Most of the time, those reactive oxygen species are picked up by the surrounding enzymes and neutralized. But sometimes those sparks they evade the system, they get out. They damage mitochondria and they damage the cellular structures. These are the reactive oxygen species. If you run a mitochondria fast and the electron transport chain fast, you'll produce more reactive oxygen species. This is an important clue for our discussion today. Okay, so now we are loaded with the basic information. Now let's see. And and by the way, I, I really loved how did they do this. So it is not that they had the mitochondria or the cell and the spike protein, and then they looked at them under the microscope. They actually used a special um, scope, which is called Raman Microspectrometer. What is that? It, it's a beautiful concept. So imagine here, this is a little tiny plate. On this plate, there are cells. Now within the cells, there are mitochondria, nucleus and everything. We just saw them. What they do is they shine a laser on this pile of cells. Look how they're going to see the mitochondria. It is such a beautiful thing. So they shine a laser on this pile of cells. What happens is every part of the cell, mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA and the mitochondrial RNA and the cell's DNA and the cell's RNA and the ribosomes, they're all made up of various kinds of structures and they're all vibrating with their own frequency. This is no pseudoscience. This is a medical science diagnostic uh, and research uh, meter. So it's not, <laughs> we're not talking about we are all vibrating. This little tiny system is vibrating or its atoms have specific structures which allow the light when it falls on them to become split in multiple parts. One of those parts is called Raman light. This Raman light can then be measured and Fortunate for us, the Raman light for mitochondrial DNA is different from mitochondrial lipids, which is different from electron transport chain structures, which is different from ribosomes and lipids and phosphates and so on. Isn't that beautiful? So they used Raman spectrometer. Why? And it is a microspectrometer. That means it can really see in a very tiny microscopic area. Why did they do this? They did this because they said through a normal microscope, 
they could not actually see inside the 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 mitochondria to see what is the damage in the mitochondria so by doing the spectrometry or spect spectrometry they were able to measure how much dna is present is it increased is it reduced are there are more mitochondria or are there less mitochondria and so on so what did they find these are research workers that you should go and handshake with them and say thank you for doing your work so what did they find they found this mitochondrial dna on one side remember they had in one set of petri dishes they had the normal microglial cells which did not have spike protein or sars cov2 in them just normal cells control they saw that the control cells in the same exact size there were 2.2 mg per milliliter dna material mitochondrial dna material and they could only do this kind of a thing with raman spectrometry or spe spectrometry not with other microscopes so beautiful i'm i'm just enamored with this on the other hand they had two more sets with the spike protein set they found that the mitochondrial dna for the same amount of cells was reduced to 1.2 mg per milliliter almost half two fold reduction in the dna same is the case with the heat inactivated sars cov2 over there in those cells where they added heat inactivated sars cov2 with the normal microglial cells these cells also had damaged mitochondria how was the mitochondria da damage we'll discuss that but what was the evidence of damaged the dna was half that of the normal cells that means either mitochondria were bursting up or they were not able to make their dna or they had the dna which is destroyed these are damaged cells and damaged mitochondria then the rna within the mitochondria mitochondrial rna not the cellular r cellular rna remember mitochondria is another cell within our cell not a cell bacteria within our cell so the dna the rna of the mitochondria which is responsible which is a copy of the genetic material of the mitochondria to make mitochondrial proteins that was increased and they said that other studies have seen that when we have spike or sars cov2 infection the mitochondrial rna increases because mitochondrial activity increases or genetic system becomes over expressed it is working more the spike protein is asking it to work more so rna quantity was increased how increased normal cells had 2.25 mg per milliliter rna versus spike cells or spike cells the cells with the spike with them 4 mg per milliliter almost double almost and the cells with the sars cov2 inactivated 2.8 mg per milliliter dna is destroying getting destroyed but in the meantime the mitochondria is trying to survive and making more rna to make more proteins to function more this is like a car that is running fast and the engine is blowing up but the car is still trying to run it's eventually going to stop then they saw this is very very interesting they saw saccharides 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 are glucose and pyruvate inside the mitochondria why are we talking about that so the biologists the biochemists the pharmacologists the <laughs> the nurses doctors medical students you know that the energy production aerobic energy production has a part which is glycolysis or breaking down the glucose then the krebs cycle or cori cycle the whole thing is called the krebs uh, system the krebs cycle inside which happens inside the mitochondria and some parts outside and so on meaning it involves mitochondria that is the aerobic respiration 
for aerobic respiration the pyruvate is a product that is used so if the pyruvate levels reduce that means mitochondrial function is not happening so what they saw was in the normal cells the glucose and pyruvate levels were 1.5 mg and in the infected cells if you will the of course the sars cov2 spike protein presence is not infection but anyways let's call it infected for our discussion in the infected cells the glucose and pyruvate levels had gone down to 0.7 mg which meant the krebs cycle is not working the energy production system isn't working correctly that also means that the cell would switch to anaerobic production it will try to make more more energy so think about it for a second what has happened the energy generation system the mitochondria was put in high gear and then it failed when it failed the parent the cell is going to try to keep going by making anaerobic energy by making energy through the anaerobic process but that would not continue for a long time as well because anaerobic process is going to number one produce less energy by using more material secondly it is going to produce a lots of acids in the production and that would then cause acidosis in that area and the tissue would get damaged and die okay then the respiratory function this is called respiration using the uh, oxygen and the nutrients and using glucose and then involving mitochondria to make atp so respiratory system is gone that means that means the hypoxia or less breathing hypoxia is lack of oxygen right here oxygen may be present but for mitochondria the cell is now going to experience hypoxia because mitochondria is not using oxygen even if it is present so cell is sort of running in a hypoxic state cell is running as if you were not breathing so all the signs and symptoms of hypoxia would start appearing even when the oxygen is normal what a destructive little components these things are okay so this is a diagram from the research where they are showing if you see here at the top the black bars are controls the red bars are heat inactivated sars cov2 present with the microglial cells and the green bars are the spike proteins and the microglial cells i just quickly looked here and on the um at the comments to make sure that my my mic is on i hope my mic is on okay so back here if the mic is on good if not you should be having fun anyways <laughs> so back here control cells control cells the black bars red are the one with the inactivated sars cov2 and the green ones are the one with the spike proteins and look at the dna amounts less and what they have done is they have put these brackets and the p values wherever this is significantly different data then they have the bracket and the p value so this is significantly different this is significantly different this is so dna is reduced rna is increased glycine is reduced lipids are almost kind of the same and unsaturated phospholipids are reduced what does that mean you must have heard you know saturated fats and unsaturated fats what a wonderful technique this spectrometry is that they can actually look at the fats and say you are unsaturated and you are saturated and I, and i can measure how much unsaturated and how much saturated fats are there <laughs> so they found that the spike protein cells the spiked cell let's call them let's make a term for ourselves spiked cells the spiked cells had more saturated phospholipids 
Now, what does that mean? I'll explain in a second. But first, let's register this sentence. Spiked cells or SARS-CoV-2 heat inactivated cells had more saturated phospholipids. What does that mean? What that means is this. Phospholipids make a cell membrane. So there is a double layer of phospholipids in our cell membranes. Then phospholipids make the membranes of all the vesicles or little compartments within the cell, the machines, the factories, the houses within the cell. Phospholipids also make membranes of the mitochondria, meaning phospholipids are everywhere in the cell. They, they are the structural component. They are the walls of the cell. If you... And the saturated phospholipid means that imagine if we have two carbon atoms, if they have double bond between them, then we call them unsaturated. But if you take double bond away and put some hydrogens and we end up with single bond, then this is saturated. Saturated lipids are actually bad lipids. They have many, many issues. However, an important issue is the instability of these walls. Saturation of the, the carbon atoms allows the these structures to be fluid. Our cell membrane is like an ocean in which different things are floating around. And it also allows the cell to be more fluid and flexible. If you have less cholesterols and less lipids and less saturated, um, more saturated systems, then all of a sudden our cell membranes start becoming rigid. When they start becoming rigid, the cells become less flexible. It is less functional. It is also a sign of stress on the cell that various parts start becoming saturated lipids. So they saw that saturated lipids increased. This is like a Fast devastation, starting from destroying the DNA, and then the result of the DNA, meaning mitochondrial DNA, and from there, mitochondrial damage, from there, the cell damage, from there, the cells damage, from there, the inflammation, and more tissue damage. You, you are sitting with me right now. This is such a great study. You're sitting with me in a little tiny helicopter and we are inside the cell, inside the mitochondria. We're running around and seeing what damage this thing is doing. Okay, now, next thing they saw. These are the phospholipids. So I just talked about it. Phospholipids are made up of phosphates. These blue guys are phosphates and then these little potato-like things are lipids, so phospholipids. And they saw that the saturation average so phospholipids or lipids have some bonds that are saturated, some that are not saturated. So there is an average. Av average saturation on the control side was 4.3. And on the other side was less. And I have just explained what does that mean. Now the question is, how did this all happen? Why did this tiny little spike protein end up doing all of this? So it turns out when the spike protein is present inside the cell. So remember, spike protein binding to ACE2 has an entirely different set of mechanics to cause damage. I'm not even talking about them. That is ACE2 binding and the spike protein and the whole fireworks that happen, that, that's separate. This is spike protein near the cell, in the cell. Microglia would pick it up and work with it. So spike protein or the inactivated SARS-CoV-2 present and cultured with the cells. What it does is it asks our cell to produce more ATP. It comes in and demands money. It says, I need energy. Why does it in need energy? Presence of spike protein activates cellular machinery and ramps it up. Now, why does it activate the machinery is not known. Why does a spike protein has to activate the machinery? Is it because it is a foreign material in there and the cell are trying to break it down and in that process it is ramping up everything? Maybe. 
maybe the spike protein is not digested once it's inside the cell and it is just continuously poking the cell and the cell is going in a hyper responsive state maybe whatever is the reason maybe it is a function of the immune cells to pick up the spike protein and then ramp up their functions to try to destroy it the end result is what we saw here that means this part is unknown but the next layer is a demand for more atp production when the cell has a demand of making more ATP, that stress is moved to mitochondria because who's responsible to make normally the ATP? Mitochondria. When mitochondria fails, cell can do the anaerobic re respiration, but mitochondria is asked, hey man, make more energy. When mitochondria makes more energy, then the sparks fly and the ROS production increases, reactive oxygen species increases. When the reactive oxygen species increase, those little sparks, they go and they start causing damage or oxidation of the lipids and other parts of the cellular tissues and DNA and the, sorry, parts of the mitochondrial tissue, tissue or meaning uh, vesicles and substances. These reactive oxygen species also end up causing oxidation of the electron transport chain. So the engine of the car, at the end of the day, the engine of our cells is the electron transport chain that is sitting in the mitochondria. Really, if, I mean, if you go all the way down to the cell and say, I want to see where the engine of the cell is. The engine of the cell is not DNA. DNA is just a book that contains our life's mysteries. It is the mitochondrial electron transport chain that is the engine of the cell. So when you run that engine and you throw a little sand in it and that sand being the oxidative stress and this, the reactive oxygen production, normally this engine is very good to take care of the ox reactive oxygen species production as it runs and makes the, the species, it can take care of them. But if you bombard it, it is going to die. The result now, so what has happened the spike said, hey, I need more ATP. Or spike did changes in the cells that resulted in more activity of the cell that resulted in a need for more ATP, which resulted in more reactive oxygen species production, which resulted in lipid becoming oxidized, which resulted in electron transport chain not working correctly. The result of all of that is metabolic dysregulation. Understandable the aerobic respiration has been disrupted. So the cell becomes all upset and saying, what the heck, I cannot make ATP with oxygen. What should I do? And it's glycolysis system start and they start making anaerobic respiration. So metabolic disruption occurs. Lipid met metabolism, metabolism <laughs> is disrupted. The result of that is mitochondrial DNA gets destroyed in this process. This is like if you pick up, I'm going to give you this gross example, but this is exactly what spike protein's result is with the mitochondria. Imagine mitochondria was a little animal and the spike protein is picking it up and, and whipping it around inside the cell and killing it. That's what it does. Mitochondrial DNA gets damaged. Of course, it doesn't really physically pick it up and whip it around, but that's, you just saw the mechanism. D DNA damage occurs, one. Inflammation occurs. When the lipids are damaged, they result in inflammation. They activate the local immune system cells. The result of that, as I said before, neuronal, this is microglial study, so here we would stay to the neurons. Neuronal inflammation, neuronal damage and death, and neurocognitive decline. Now, then what would happen? When the neuronal deaths are occurring, when the tissue damage is happening, when this glycolysis has started, anaerobic respiration has started, acidic environment is now developing. In addition to that, when this damage starts, what is happening? Now we're going to get out of the cell to see what is going to happen in the surroundings now. We were within the mitochondria, then we came out of mitochondria within the cell. Now we're going to get out of the cell and see what is going to happen to the neighbors. 
So the broken cells, the damaged cells, the damaged mitochondria, the damaged cell, they are going to release PAMPs and the presence of the spike protein and the pathogens. PAMP is pathogen associated molecular patterns, foreign material patterns. DAMPs, damage associated molecular patterns, broken cells, broken DNA, broken mitochondria, the things from within the mitochondria re leaking out, ATP extra present, oxidized lipids, as I mentioned before, heat shock proteins are activated. Heat shock proteins are within the cell. These are special proteins that are just sitting by and any stress to the cell will activate them. Imagine in every home, we have a person sitting. Let's say we have a dog who gets activated if there is a stress and starts barking and biting or a person sitting there whose job is to guard. And if there is a stress, that person gets up and starts shooting others. So this is the heat shock protein. When it is activated, it tries to restore the problems. But in that process, what will happen? Apoptosis can occur and autophagy can occur. Inflammation can occur. When mitochondrial damage occurs, many times in the cell, if the cell knows I'm not going to be able to recover, it starts the caspases. Caspases are little tiny proteins within the cell, which then activate the ubiquitins, which are another set of proteins, which eventually cause the cell to say, you should die. And that is called apoptosis. Apoptosis would occur. Autophagy would start. The cell in scrambling to figure out where are the nutrients, how do I survive, it's going to start eating its own little parts. But a cell that should not do autophagy and has been asked to do autophagy without any debris or trash around, it's just going to eat up its own normal things and eat itself to death. Inflammasome activation will occur. And we have done this discussion many times before. The difference between apoptosis and inflammasome is inflammasome is a process unique to the immune cells. When an immune cell knows that I'm going to die and it knows that I am dying correctly, meaning I'm told to die, I've done my function, I've fought with the virus, the inflammation is not needed anymore. I'm told to die. I will just do an apoptosis and silently die without causing inflammation, without saying I'm destroyed. Why the heck did you do this? On the other hand, if a cell, immune cell especially, was not expecting to die, was brought under stress to be killed, then it would become a bomb and it would release cytokines and chemokines and inflammatory molecules everywhere to say, you are not going to kill me without me crying about it. And that cell is an inflammasome or makes inflammasomes or activates inflammasomes, which then activate the whole immune system around. Just imagine when this cell goes pop, the immune system around is just going to become so active and they would descend on that area and the fight would start. Who's going to pay the price? the cells. So what are the takeaways? What is the summary of this discussion? The summary is, here is a study. It is in Feb 2022, so pretty recent, which shows presence of spike protein alone or heat inactivated SARS-CoV-2 with the microglial cells, which are the immune cells of the brain, causes those cells' mitochondria to be damaged, which in turn causes the cells to die, inflammation to occur, cognitive decline to happen, neuronal tissue and immune tissue cells to be apoptosis, to have apoptosis or inflammation, they die. The second thing, the benefit of this discussion, this, um, this study, they say, authors, they say we have created a new mechanism of diagnosing the progress of the disease. So use Raman microspectrometry to figure out how bad the damage is occurring. 
And the third, I think, which is very interesting, and I actually then put it on, down here, is they said this study of theirs helps provide information for the healthcare leaders or doctors or researchers to say, figure out how to protect a mitochondria in this situation with the spike proteins or with the SARS-CoV-2. So let me read it for you. They said in this green part at the end, furthermore, therapeutic strategies that modulate mitochondrial processes may be efficacious in treating patients with neuro-COVID. That would also mean long COVID. Our study calls for the development of mitochondria-targeted pharmaceutical drugs that can neutralize virus-induced reactive oxygen species production in the cellular organelle. So now there is a one question. <laughs> so uh, let me wind up one uh, this thought first. So you see now that, number one, there is a diagnostic approach that they have given, and number two, they have indicated where the therapies should be targeted. So if you speak with your doctor, if you speak with the research workers, if you speak with the healthcare leaders, say, hey man, think of mitochondrial protection. Now, I had left one question in your mind in the beginning, and that was, is it everything in the cell just getting damaged? And we are saying, well, here is the mitochondria. And the answer to that is no. And how did they know the answer? What they did was, they looked at other parts of the cells and they looked at the lipid in the other parts. They looked at the lipids present in the cell. They looked at the Golgi operators and the integrity of the Golgi operators. So this is like you're looking at a community and say where the fire is coming from. Every house is burning or just one house is burning. And they found out that all other vesicles, all other cellular machineries, did not have lipid issues or did not have the kind of reactive oxygen species damage that they were seeing in the mitochondria. So this was a specifically targeted to mitochondria problem. Second thing, they said, maybe you will think that if inside the mitochondria there are proteins and there are things that are damaged, maybe they came in from outside. They were actually damaged outside and then they just ran in the mitochondria. They said, we actually measured the amount of substances inside the mitochondria. They were not more than the other standard mitochondrial amount. So they were not being trafficked in. They were not piling in damaged proteins from outside to the inside. So all of this proved that the damage is actually to mitochondria specifically instead of mitochondria just being a bystander. Okay, now, last thing, and then we stop. Sorry, we've gone for 48 minutes. One more study here, just for reference. Here is another study. This is actually 2021 study, October 2021. Mitochondrial dynamics in SARS-CoV-2 spike protein treated human microglia implications for neuro-COVID. And they say here, I'm, I'm just going to present their result. Thus, our data suggests that SARS-CoV-2 induces a significant inflammatory response. Now, within the SARS-CoV-2, it is the spike protein they're talking about. Increased oxidative stress, we talked about that in this study as well. Inflammasome activation, we talked about that in this study too. And mitochondrial dysfunction in microglial cells, we talked about that here too. All of which contribute to COVID-associated neuropathology. This study provides important me mechanistic insights into SARS-CoV-2-induced mitochondrial dysfunction, which underlies COVID-19-associated neuropathology. This is it. This is the talk. So with this, I want I have a couple of announcements. Number one, please like, subscribe, and share. <laughs> and inside the description of this video, there are a bunch of 
links. There is a link to buy access to Dr. Bean, one-time non-recurring access to 900 videos at the rate of 10 cents per video. So please take advantage of that. If you wanted to support this work, there are links to use PayPal to support it, or you can buy me a coffee, or you can become part of patrons, or you can become part of locals network, and you can become part of Substack as well. With this and final announcement, I'm going to go meet team from FLCCC on 7, 8, and 9 of next month, August. So we'll be in the Charleston Harbor Resort and Marina. I would reach there, I think at 1.30 or 40 during the day on 7th. And 3 to 6 p.m. is the time available where if you would like to meet or have a cup of coffee together where I will I will offer you coffee so please swing by uh, I would just request you to tell me beforehand so I'll figure out some way of um, getting that information then on 8th from 5 to 6 we will finish our discussions by 5 I believe or 4 30 and then 6 o'clock and later is the dinner so 5 to 6 and then on 9th, I'll actually be returning on 9th. So we'll finish by 12, 12.30. So from 1.30 to 2.30, I'm open. And then by 3 o'clock, I'll go to the airport. And 5 o'clock is the flight back. So that is the announcement. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time, for listening, for learning together. This is a very interesting study and specifically mitochondrial damage because of spike protein is a very important area so thank you very much please like subscribe and share and i would see you tomorrow bye bye for now